these man-made things. The psalmist said, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 19 said, Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Imagine that we here at Lakeview are expecting someone very important to come and visit Lakeview. <clears throat> Let's say it's someone that everyone knows about, but few people have ever seen in person. Maybe somebody like Howard Hughes, who's kind of the right person. <clears throat> We've known he was coming for a long time, so we made a huge effort to get everything ready for this dignitary to make his appearance. We manicured the lawns, we trimmed all the shrubbery, we painted every room, we fixed all the potholes in the driveway, praise the Lord. <laughs> we cleaned everything <coughs> to where it was immaculate. The only thing is, we didn't know exactly when it was that this person was going to arrive. So we had people on lookout for anyone who looked important so we could quickly <laughs> gather our congregation and give him the greeting that he deserved. Then one day, a member spotted a stretch limo as part of a convoy of black limousines driving through Asheville, heading towards Waynesville. The call went out. We think this is him. People scrambled, arriving from all around to make it to the church before the limo arrived. And sure enough, the convoy took exit 27 and drove towards Waynesville. Then they got off at the US-19 split toward Maggie Valley. Then they turned right at the light just below the church. We had people with welcome signs lining the road from the light all the way up the hill of, of Rathbone Cove, then on to Nazarene Way, and guiding the limo into the church parking lot. The crowd fell in behind the limo as it passed, and when it pulled up to the front door, there was a sizable crowd cheering and waving welcome signs. Music was blaring, and the church board and the pastor were standing at the entrance to greet our dignitary. After a few awkward moments, the door of the limo finally opens and out steps a sharply dressed man, younger than we expected, and the crowd cheers once more. He walks up to the pastor and the board and asks, what's this all about? The pastor tells him, well, Mr. Dignitary, we're so excited to have you with us today. We've been preparing for this moment for months, and we can't believe you're finally here. The crowd cheers once again and then quiets down. You've been expecting me for months, you say? Oh, yes, Mr. Dignitary. We, we're so happy to have you with us. I don't know how you've been expecting me for months. What do you mean, sir? We received notice that you were coming six months ago. Well, that's impossible, the man says. I only proposed to my fiance three weeks ago. She lives in these condos up here, and I was coming to pick her up to take her to our wedding. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Looks like we've had a case of mistaken identity. Ooh, boy, but it was exciting. <laughs> well, that's not exactly what happened when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on that donkey's colt that Sunday with palm branches waving and cloaks on the ground and adults and children alike proclaiming Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord because Jesus really is the Son of David. And he did indeed come in the name of the Lord. He is the Lord. But he was not coming for the reason they thought he was coming. The case of mistaken identity in his case was not one of who, but one of why. You've heard the rhetorical question, what would you do if you threw a party and nobody came? Well, what would you do if you threw a celebration for someone's arrival and it turned out that you were celebrating their walk towards the electric chair? 
because that's essentially what was happening on this day roughly 1994 years ago in Jerusalem. Those who were waving palms and shouting Hosanna and celebrating Jesus' arrival believed they were welcoming the next earthly king of the Jews. And, that, and they were, but his earthly kingdom was not about to be established that day, nor even that week. In fact, it has yet to be established in all its fullness. Jesus was coming into Jerusalem not to finalize the arrival of his earthly reign, but to begin laying the foundation for it. We're told that he himself became the chief cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected, the stone against which all other stones in the foundation would be measured to make sure that they were in line with him. To make sure that the house that he is building would be straight and strong and able to endure not just a few decades or a few centuries or even a thousand years or two, but forever and forever. What's the oldest man-made structure you have ever visited in your lifetime? Think about that. You were in the Holy Land. I'm sure you saw things going back many thousands of years. When I was stationed in England in the mid-80s, back in the 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so long ago now. I visited Shakespeare's home in Stratford-upon-Avon. I visited St. Paul's Cathedral in London. I even went to some medieval castles, one of which we came upon by accident. We, we were driving on these backcountry roads in England, which are even narrower than some of the roads here in Haywood County. And we, when I remember we were going around a curve and up a hill at the same time. And just as we got to the top of the hill, boom, there was this beautiful medieval castle in front of us. And we were awestruck. We thought, oh, we got to go there. So we did. One of the towers of one of the castles that I visited dated all the way back to the, day, the days of the Norman conquest of England, 1088 wow. AD. Then I went to Manchester, England on a work and witness trip in 2005. You helped me go there, some of you. We visited a nearby town and actually walked on a road that was built by the Romans just about the time that Jesus was alive. That's not the oldest structure I've visited. When I was stationed in England back then, I also went to another site, even older than that Roman road. It's a place called Stonehenge. You may have heard about it. <laughs> that dates back somewhere around 22 to 2400 BC, which is roughly the time of Noah and the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. But as amazing as all of that is, Jesus came to build a church that will stand not only the test of time, but the test of eternity. Mm, amen. It will last for endless ages. Amen. Even after time itself has ceased to exist. We can't imagine that. <laughs> How can time cease to exist? Well, that's a very good question. Well, let me ask you a question in response. How do we measure time? With the rising of the sun, and the setting of the same, and the rising of the moon, and its many phases. The Bible says the Lord gave us these to mark the hours and the days. These are the signs of our time. <laughs> but the Bible says there's going to come a day when God will make a new heaven and a new earth, and the sun and the moon will be no more because we won't need their light because the Lamb will be the light. God himself will be the light in the new Jerusalem. No sun, no moon, no stars such as we know them. In other words, no time. Yeah. All eternity. The ever-present reality. And when all of that happens, the church <clears throat> will only have begun to reign with Christ. Did you hear what I said? Yes. We will only have begun to reign with Christ. Did you know someday we will reign with Christ? A dispute also arose among the disciples in Luke 22, 24, as to which of them 
was considered to be the greatest. And Jesus said, the, king of the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Mm. It is, not, is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus said to the lukewarm church in Laodicea, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, whether they knew it or not, those who were praising the Lord when he made his triumphal entry that day, were worshiping the Lord for the right reason or for the right thing. They were shouting, Hosanna, which literally means, save us now. Oh. Amen. Jesus had come to do exactly that, but he was not coming to save them from the Romans or from any of their earthly enemies. He was coming to save them from an enemy far more dangerous, far more present and far more destructive than Rome. He was coming to save them from death and hell. He was coming to save them from the enemy of their souls. They were saying all the right words just in the wrong context. Mm -hmm. So what does all of this have to do with us today, you ask? Well, first of all, we need to ask ourselves a question or two. Am I worshiping Jesus at all? Mm -hmm. Right reason or wrong reason? Mm -hmm. You see, not everybody in the crowd that day was worshiping and celebrating Jesus' arrival. Some were asking, who is this man? They didn't even know. They didn't have a clue. Some were telling Jesus to silence those kids who were worshiping him. No doubt many were just looking on in bewilderment. Some were perhaps even scoffing or jeering. And the Jewish religious leaders were seething because... They had already begun to plot how they were going to get rid of this Jesus once and for all. And here's the crowd worshiping and celebrating him. If you are worshiping Jesus, and I hope you are, that's why we come here. Is it for the right reason? Are you like those who were in it for what's in it for me? Political freedom, national identity. A free meal or two, because we know he has done that before. <laughs> Healings galore. Only three people in the crowd that day had ever seen Jesus in all his glory. Peter, James, and John they saw him on that day when he was transfigured before them. And they saw him with Elijah and Moses. And they were talking back and forth. And Peter had the audacity to speak up. You know, if Jesus... Elijah and Moses were talking. I think I'd shut up for a while. <laughs> I'll try to listen into that conversation. But even those three would all abandon him in his hour of need. Perhaps the only ones who were truly worshiping Jesus in purity and innocence were those disciples in the crowd, in the crowd that the Pharisees tried to get Jesus to rebuke. But Jesus told them, I tell you, if, if they keep quiet, the very stones will so cry out. It seems that far too often we only come to Jesus when we have a need. And we do that a lot. Because we're needy a lot. Mm. Are, are we not? Yes. Someone is sick. Someone had an accident. We've run into a financial need or we had a relational crisis we come to Jesus out of our need. And that's okay. That's okay. God cares about those things. And he wants us to come to him for our needs to be met. He wants us to ask. He says, knock and it shall be opened to you. Seek and you shall find. 
Ask and it will be given to you. But how often do we come to him just out of love, out of thanksgiving, out of adoration and joy? How often do we actually worship the Lord instead of just coming with our laundry list of needs and wants? I've been spending more time since the first of the year doing two things. Spiritual disciplines, I think they call them. Methods, I think some people call them. <laughs> Means of, or avenues of grace, John Wesley called them. Bible reading and prayer. I'm learning also the value of silence. Like I said, if I've been on that mountain that day, I would have wanted to just listen. And I had gotten to a point prior to all of that. And I just kind of felt a little dry. You know, we were just kind of doing things, doing, uh, trying to do things the right way, the right things the right way, and keep things going. You know, COVID was all about just keeping things going. Just keeping us alive, spiritually as well as physically. And, and there was a lot of that. Just, you know, doing what we could to try to hold together and to continue to grow and study and, and try to worship as best we could. But after a while, just keeping things going isn't enough. We have to remember why we do things. Why are we? Why do we come on Sunday, week after week? It's not just to bring our needs. That's part of it. And, and that's a blessed part. But Jesus said, cast your cares upon me. I've got this. That's what he said. I can handle this. But once we've done that, what do we do? Do we take time to truly worship the Lord? Honor him. Bask in his presence. Sit there long enough to let Jesus and Moses and Elijah have a conversation. Boy. Oh, why didn't they write that down? Maybe when we get to heaven, we'll be able to find out. Mm. What were you talking about up there? As we close today, I, I want us to practice what I've been talking about. I want us to take a, a few moments to just worship the Lord and glory in His presence. We're going to have a song, and then we'll have a benediction. And I hope that as we sing this song together, you will allow it to be sort of our triumphal entry today for Jesus, that we can join in that procession and celebrate. We don't have to ask Jesus to save us. He's already done that. But we can praise him because he has. So would you stand with me, and we're going to sing this song, and just worship the Lord.